Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining. We're just going to wait one minute here. Uh, I know one of the peer conversations went a little long, uh, so we have a few more people joining, uh, and then we'll get started in just one minute. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining again. Uh, sorry about that. We had uh, quite a few folks hopping in late uh, from a peer conversation. We wanted to give them a second uh, to have some time to join us. All right, so this will be um, a little bit of a deeper dive into fundraising. Um, we also will be doing a uh, donor engagement breakout uh, tomorrow morning uh, that I recommend you all um, also uh, attend along with some of our um, fund fund foundation sessions. Uh, we'll have a foundation session this afternoon uh, and also a foundation session uh, tomorrow morning as well. Um, when we think about fundraising uh, during COVID, uh, in general, we know A, uh, it is a challenging, confusing time. Um, we'll talk a little bit tomorrow morning about some lessons learned from past crisis fundraising, uh, but we also want to, you know, recognize the fact that uh, this crisis and situation is unique, right? Uh, it's something none of us have dealt with before, so none of us have exactly the right answers about what to be doing right now. Uh, but we are seeing some early successes, uh, and based on past crisis and also some early returns, uh, we have some projections that we're planning for uh, in terms of what will work uh, and what we should expect. Uh, in general, at a high level, um, a little bit um, like we talked about before, um, some of this data comes from surveys we've done of the small nonprofits that we work with. Um, and when kind of thinking through um, some of the things we're seeing there, um, we know that already COVID-19 has kind of drastically changed our... Um, so again, just uh, quickly, um, you know, some of the big things we're seeing right now, um, especially in kind of terms of data, um, is just that, you know, three quarters of our partners are facing, uh, are changing how they have to fundraise, uh, and over 70% are facing financial challenges. Uh, so we know that not only is there kind of a renewed urgency in our fundraising, but we're also having to fundraise differently uh, than we did before. Uh, and kind of regardless of the social issue we work on, right, or kind of the, the work we do, uh, it's really important we're still kind of actively fundraising right now. Um, from every kind of past example of crisis fundraising we have, uh, we've seen that the organizations that keep actively fundraising throughout uh, and don't kind of pause or uh, slow down their communications are the ones that kind of do best. Uh, so the first uh, group of kind of fundraising we'll talk about are individual donors. Uh, so with individual donors, a couple of different tips. Um, so when prioritizing kind of donor outreach, uh, we're thinking about kind of who, when, and how. Um, so for who, um, you know, donors that we're reaching out to first, uh, we're going to start at the top, right, and uh, want to make sure we're reaching out to our major donors right now, uh, especially over the next couple of months. Uh, we want to make sure going into the end of year, our major donors, especially those that will be giving during the end of year, um, are aware of what we're working on uh, and aware of some of the um, pivot and some of the virtual services we're providing. Um, secondly, uh, we want to focus on donors who typically give during this time. Um, so donors that uh, are typically kind of um, giving during the time of year that give maybe in more in August, September time, uh, it's important to make sure um, that they're being engaged right now. And then finally, any of our long-term donors, those are really to us, we want to make sure are um, engaged right now in what we're doing. Uh, and then uh, in terms of kind of when, um, if we're making an ask, we want to be really specific about what that ask is for uh, and kind of why we're making that ask. Um, we know our donors are facing kind of an uncertain uh, financial future with kind of jobs and stocks. Uh, so we want to make sure that if we're asking them, uh, we're asking them for something very specific that they can kind of identify with. Um, and in terms of how we're engaging donors right now, uh, most people are doing kind of Zoom or one-on-one -on -one calls, especially with major donors. Um, for the Zoom sessions, um, you know, giving them the option. A lot of us are Zoomed out uh, and probably don't want to be on Zoom any more than we have to be. Uh, but donors might still really be looking for it. We know they feel more of a connection to the staff um, whenever they are doing um, kind of a, an in-person kind of video chat. Um, so that can be really great uh, for the donor, even if we ourselves are a little tired of it. Um, sending a short kind of note to card, um, especially if they're kind of a past donor, uh, can be a great way to get folks engaged. Um, as Jamie mentioned, this is a great time for gratitude. 
um, you know, even if we find ourselves, and especially if we find our organization in a good place right now, it's because of the support we got in the past. Uh, so we can clear to donors that we really appreciate that support. Uh, and then finally, um, as we kind of talked about earlier briefly, um, picking a small team to do kind of a couple daily calls to donors allows us to actually pretty quickly get uh, to a large number of donors uh, that we're able to reach out to uh, and probably a little deeper than we typically have talked to in the past. All right. Uh, and again, uh, we've, we've tried to mute everyone. Um, so if you're unmuted, uh, if you could please mute yourself. Um, so we've tried to, to mute all. All right. Um, the second thing around donors um, is that we need to keep asking, right? So when we're asking individual donors to support right now, um, there's a couple of things we want to make sure we're including in that app. Um, for mission, right, so we're still going to talk about the core thing we do and kind of the core kind of who we are as an organization. Um, so, you know, our main mission, the pitch, and the reason people care about the work we do um, is still going to be the same as it was before COVID-19, right? If people love the work we do because we empower students to support change, they're still going to love us because we empower students to support change. Um, so thinking about um, how we kind of focus on that core mission still is going to be really important. And that's going to be the, the kind of central part of our pitch. Um, secondly, um, we're going to think about context, right? So just because that pitch still resonates, there's going to be a lot of nonprofits whose pitches resonate right now. Uh, so it's really important we're thinking about how we add urgency uh, to the solicitation that we're doing. Um, it could be the fact that our clients need more support than ever before. Um, could be the fact that new clients um, have uh, emerging needs, right, or our existing clients have emerging needs, or just as there's new challenges for the organization as we kind of try to create basically a virtual nonprofit um, or kind of virtual programming, and maybe we haven't done that before. Uh, so really important to think about how we add that urgency and how we add that context. Uh, and then finally, clarity. Um, so we want to make sure that we're adding plenty of kind of um, clarity and explaining kind of the pivot we've made um, so folks understand and are familiar with um, our plans and the work we're doing right now. Because um, as I mentioned kind of during the first session, uh, we really want to reduce uncertainty for folks and make sure that donors especially um, have a sense of what we're working on and what we're doing. Uh, a couple of questions um, from uh, the audience and also feel free to ask any questions throughout. We'll answer those as they come up or at the end today. Um, Someone's talking about how to do some of this kind of donor outreach if we don't have a large development team. Um, so especially on individual donors, we know um, that it takes time and there's kind of no way around that. Um, but we do see um, lots of stuff with kind of getting um, either board members that are uh, willing to make kind of a small time investment um, or kind of um, maybe kind of uh, long-term volunteers that could do some stewardship calls and gratitude calls that we give them a script. Um, so there's a few folks other than just staff uh, that can help with this. Um, but typically, in terms of like prioritization, I would first prioritize um, sending out at least one monthly communication to all donors right now, um, letting all donors know a little bit about what's happening at the organization, so writing a monthly email, uh, and trying to, over the coming weeks, um, talk to or at least leave a voicemail with or an email with the majority of my major donors. So even if I think about just myself as the ED, doing one donor call or one donor email a day, um, I'm still going to be able to talk to my top 25 donors or send a message to them um, across the month and my top 50 across the next two months going into end of year. And if I can guarantee that I talk to my top 50 donors in the next two months before end of year, that's a pretty good start. Um, so doing that in addition to the monthly, I would say if you're kind of a one-person team, uh, would be where I would start. You know, a lot of focus right now especially is going to be on major donors um, and we know part of the reason is that, that most major donors especially if engaged will continue to give to the organization uh, and middle level donors are often getting invited to some of these kind of uh, donor events uh, but we might not be doing a lot right now for our smaller level donors our smaller dollar donors um, but it's really important we're engaging them because this is actually the group that's going to be most variable right some of us are going to lose um, you know 80 to 90 percent um, of those small level donors because either they're not giving this year because the economic issues um, that maybe have personally impacted them or because they've shifted their funding to just be kind of frontline support um, or directly in the racial justice space. Uh, 
but the more engagement we do with them, the closer to that kind of 40, 45% retention we might get. And that's gonna make a big difference for a lot of us depending on our donor base. Um, so a few things we see that's really important for engaging these kind of lower level donors, uh, especially those that might be new to the organization and in general just have less commitment uh, to your team and kind of the work you all do. Um, we wanna make sure A, that they are part of those monthly email engagements. We wanna make sure that they're getting kind of regular emails um, they hear what's happening at the organization and have a sense of what's happening at the organization. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we're giving them something to do as well. Um, so it's really important right now, even as people are stuck at home, you know, we've heard this from a lot of organizations that uh, typically have really robust volunteer programs, but their volunteers can't come into the office right now and do their kind of typical service. Um, it's really important to get folks like that um, or small level donors, um, something to do, whether it be um, just kind of a personal action, right? So we've seen a lot of environmental organizations encourage folks to, like change their light bulbs, right? Or like start a home recycling program or like go to your local park and like pick up trash for 20 minutes during this. Um, we've seen other folks maybe give folks something to do in terms of like knowledge, right? Like take this time to like read this article to learn more about the history of the social issue in our town. Um, it could be an advocacy element about calling, uh, you know, local city council or something about an issue. Um, whatever that looks like, giving them something to do, even if they don't do it, makes them feel more active and more engaged, right? Um, so even if I'm not going to do the recycling program you're asking me about, the fact you asked me makes me feel a lot more connected to the work you do and much more active uh, in terms of our kind of relationship as a donor and nonprofit. Um, so giving someone a challenge is really important. Uh, and then finally, overall, our tone should be positive. Um, even amidst all these challenges um, that we're facing, that you know our clients are facing, the organization is facing, uh, we still know typically folks give more uh, and give more often because of messages of positive emotion than negative. Uh, so making people fear, you know, feel kind of fear, right? Feel um, something might be taken away um, is less effective uh, as a fundraising appeal then kind of hope and change and kind of positive outlook. Now we can be realistic. We can talk about those challenges for sure, but make sure that the emotions around the act of giving are still positive, right? Despite all of this, if you give, it will make a difference. We want them to feel that kind of difference making uh, when they're thinking about giving to us. Um, two things we want to avoid right now with grassroots donors. Um, one that's related to that is sugarcoating, right? So we don't want to kind of sugarcoat over the issues. Uh, they know that there's real challenges in place. So we want to address those and kind of run with that. Uh, and we don't want to just stop sending stuff to them. Some people are worried about overwhelming their donors right now, um, even their grassroots donors. Uh, but as we talked about time and time again already today, um, it's really important we kind of keep uh, that conversation going. Uh, and then in terms of, kind of how we're meeting with our donors, um, we need to think about virtual group meetings. So in addition to those one-on-one -on -one calls, um, we probably aren't gonna be able to talk to everyone that way. It may not even be appropriate to talk to everyone that way. So thinking about how we engage groups of donors at the same time is gonna be increasingly important, especially over the next couple of months as we lead into the end of year giving season. Um, you know, when we think about those virtual group meetings, what uh, typically helps and makes those work best, uh, that they're really targeted. Uh, we don't want to kind of try to cover everything under the sun during this or just have no real purpose. We want to really have a main point uh, and a focus for the audience uh, for the type of event we're doing. Uh, most of the time, these work best with about 20 to 40 people invited. Um, you know, it makes it feel a little bit more exclusive. Uh, if 200 people are on the Zoom, it feels a little too public. Uh, so inviting 40 or 50 people to one of these briefings uh, can be a great way to make them feel uh, really targeted uh, and really appreciated. And our goal should be to keep it about 45 minutes or less. Uh, we typically see, especially for digital engagement, uh, it actually starts dropping pretty quickly after 15 minutes, uh, even more so after 30 and 45 and drastically after an hour. Um, so really trying to keep the meeting at most to an hour, uh, but preferably 30 or 45 minutes. Uh, and really keep that sense of like, you know, this is coffee with the ED and we're gonna tell you two things about what our pivot uh, is right now. Or we're gonna tell you three things we're thinking about for students in the fall, two things we're thinking about our local environment, um, whatever it is, but keeping it really focused and really short. Uh, in terms of um, facilitated, uh, we wanna make sure it's not just kind of a open, uh, you know, question and answer, but actually a little bit more focused than that. Uh, we may wanna have an, you know, a mix of recorded video and live video. Either way, we've actually seen pretty good engagement with. 
Um, so feel free to do the recorded stuff. We do see a little bit better engagement with live, um, but if you do a good job kind of recording those uh, videos ahead of time, those can still be effective. Um, and using the chat function, um, just like we are today, using it for questions, comments, reinforcing points, uh, dialogue between participants, uh, can really make a better feel of community during these events uh, than if we're um, not really kind of prioritizing use of that chat function. Uh, and then finally, in terms of how to make it engaging, try to have some back and forth with the audience. So either asking questions that they're then chatting or unmuting and answering. Um, breakout rooms can be really helpful uh, if it's a larger audience to get some kind of peer-to-peer -peer conversation going uh, and trying to give them some type of action item at the end uh, so they leave with something to do. Uh, in terms of fundraising events right now, um, it's really important we're deciding basically for all of our in-person events uh, for the rest of the fall, if not for the rest of 2020, um, are we postponing it? Um, are we just canceling it outright or are we moving it virtual? Uh, if we're moving it virtual, there's really three options for what that can look like in terms of like a virtual gala or virtual fundraising event. Uh, it could be a live stream event. So this is going to be something where the vast majority of the event is live. It might have some small recorded elements, but most of it is live. Um, it's definitely the most urgent. And we see typically gets the best attendance, right? Because uh, folks feel like, oh, it's actually happening at 7 o'clock. I better be there. Um, the downside of this uh, it can be a little costly or challenging to produce. Uh, to really do it well. Uh, it can be a lot of work for staff to kind of prep for. Um, obviously, you're kind of uh, then hoping that no issues like internet connectivity happen. Um, and also, we don't see folks typically watching recorded versions of that as much. Um, we still see some um, legacy viewing there, but not as much of those already recorded to begin with. Um, the other thing, too, is just simply a lot of our donors probably have the kids at home, right? Uh, they might be on weird work schedules right now. So it's hard to know exactly when people are free and when people are going to engage. A recorded event. Um, so this is kind of sharing prompts to recorded videos with the audience. So these are videos we make ahead of time and then we're having them watch kind of all at once. The nice thing about this is that folks can definitely watch it at other times if they prefer. Um, usually they have kind of a viewing window. Um, so easier kind of production than live in a lot of ways uh, allows us to be a bit more creative uh, and have a little bit longer to put the content together. Um, but there are some real tech limitations, both uh, we're going to need our staff to have some tech um, familiarity to make this content, and then also um, our audience has some tech familiarity to kind of access it. Uh, and it's a little harder to engage, because obviously the content itself is recorded. So kind of chat is kind of usually our best option to engage there. I would say the most successful events we're seeing really are using a mix of these two options. And then finally, some folks are choosing just to do a campaign. Um, so kind of cut the event out totally not try to recreate it uh, virtually, and just do kind of an online fundraising. Uh, for foundation giving, um, it's really important we're reaching out right now actively. Um, there's a foundation session, the next breakout session, and also another one tomorrow, so I won't spend too long on this. Uh, but the better relationship we have with our program officer right now, the more likely that as things shift, uh, we'll still be included or still thought of uh, by those foundation partners. Um, in terms of priorities, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of, if not even maybe most foundations have some type of emergency COVID support right now. Um, but we are hearing from the, uh, a good chunk, uh, if not the majority, uh, that foundations are still going to support their regular priorities for this year. So we haven't heard a lot of foundations kind of uh, wholesale changing what they fund yet. Um, but we do think that might happen more in 2021. Um, as people kind of adjust and kind of reprioritize different issues. Uh, we have been asked a little bit if foundation giving is going to go down this year. Um, we don't expect that. Um, anytime we're talking about endowments and foundation giving because of their endowments, uh, we don't see that show up usually for a year or two. Uh, so it likely wouldn't actually, if anything happens in the stock market, uh, would not really impact foundation giving until next year or even the following year. Um, anytime there's a crisis, we see usually a shift in foundation fundraising. Um, you know, from the 2008 recession, the shift was towards fewer, bigger grants so they could track impact a bit more and more impact metric uh, required of foundations uh, of nonprofit grantees. Uh, what we expect to see this time, although we don't know if this will totally shake out uh, to be the two main trends, uh, we already saw this before um, some of the protests around Black Lives Matter, but um, early on during COVID because of the disparities of how um, the pandemic is impacting different communities. 
Uh, we saw a lot of foundations beginning to talk about racial justice and systemic injustice, uh, and even more so now uh, in light of Black Lives Matter. Um, and then we also are seeing more foundations look at um, how you're collaborating with others, or at least how you're thinking about your role in the broader ecosystem. Uh, this pandemic's made it clear that no one nonprofit is able to do everything for a community. Uh, it takes kind of a group of organizations working together. Uh, so foundations are interested in how you kind of fit into that broader puzzle. Uh, when writing these grants right now, uh, we're really focused on both kind of past work to prove our program's effective, what we're doing now in terms of our kind of virtual pivot, and then what our plan is for at least the rest of 2020, if not the rest of the grant cycle. Um, and being honest there, that we have some uncertainty, but we have a variety of scenarios we plan for. Because um, foundations know that we don't know exactly what programming is going to look like in October, let alone February. Um, someone was asking if they are getting support right now during COVID, um, should they assume that's kind of a one-off gift because of COVID or long-term? Uh, we would say any gifts right now, um, even if it's due to kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, a friend of a friend, kind of a special COVID fund, um, these are all folks we're going to try to shepherd, right? If they were interested enough in what you're doing during a crisis, uh, they probably will be interested in your work uh, when things kind of settle back down in the future. Um, a couple kind of final things. Um, yeah, we want to set some clear goals for the rest of 2020. Uh, we want to be in touch with donors and foundations kind of monthly. Um, foundations as well should be getting those kind of monthly updates we're sending. Um, make a real plan um, for how we're going to use the next two months to get people ready for end of year. Once again, we want to make sure people feel knowledgeable and engaged about our work um, going into October. Uh, getting creative, you know, we heard a few examples of people doing kind of virtual film screenings or virtual coffees with their um, executive director, but find some different ways to get people engaged. Uh, so it's not just kind of a monologue on Zoom. Um, think about context. Uh, we've seen some of the most successful fundraising events be ones that have been shifted to like a virtual family fundraiser. Uh, people are at home with kids, they don't have anywhere to take them, and they're looking desperately for things to do. Um, so adding some type of content to that, or just really just thinking about the context our donors are in uh, is really important uh, for any events we're doing right now for them. And then finally, adding some type of gamified element. Could be an online challenge. Uh, we've seen some people do like a selfie challenge during their events and dress up and dress down. Some of their participants are in sweatsuits, others are in real suits. Uh, whatever that looks like, adding something fun to it. People are looking for that sense of community uh, that comes with kind of playing a game. Uh, with that, uh, we just have a couple of minutes left. So any any final questions people have? All right, great. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap for you. Go ahead. Uh, I have a question. I'm a very, very small nonprofit. And I have um, small meaning I'm by myself and just some volunteers. And I'm finding it hard to find funding at this time. Um, I, I know the work that I do is important. Uh, I have a STEM program that um, we try to reach underserved community, but I don't have the funding. And I've looked at the Foundation Center. I've got a little bit, you know, I got some donations from friends and family, but how do I get that one funding that will really help me help the organization blossom and really grow and really serve the people that I'm reaching out to. Because one of the problems that I find is that I have my program, but I'm not reaching those people that I want to reach because they can't afford my program. And that's kind of flipping my organization upside down. Definitely. Yeah, I think, um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up here, but I think, um, you know, there's not kind of one, one clear answer there, but I think one of the big things is we do know um, acquisition of kind of new donors or foundations right now um, is unfortunately going to be really difficult. Not not impossible, but difficult just because uh, during uncertainty and a crisis, people mm -hmm. turn towards what they know. Um, mm -hmm. So people kind of turn back towards organizations they funded before or worked mm -hmm. with before. Uh, so two ways around that. Um, one on the foundation front, really leveraging kind of board or kind of existing donors for any contacts they have. And then in general, one bright spot we've seen in fundraising, which we'll talk a little bit more at one of the breakout sessions about, um, is peer-to-peer. -peer. So peer-to-peer -peer campaigns have been really successful during COVID um, because of the fact that I may not know your organization, but if my friend does and they ask me and tell me this is worth my money and worth my time, um, during this time, I trust them, right? Uh, so I might make a gift quickly because of that. Uh, so really encouraging folks to think about the power of peer-to-peer 
um, especially if you haven't tried it before, um, maybe combining that with something like a Giving Tuesday campaign, uh, and then having a real plan ahead of time for when those people who already know me and like me get their friends who don't know me to give, largely because of their asking, what's my stewardship plan for them? So when I get that friend of a friend in the door, how am I going to kind of get them engaged mm -hmm. uh, and get them kind of uh, to stick around long term? So. Okay. Uh, that, thank, you. Uh, thank you all. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we're going to take a short break and then we'll uh, get back together for the racial justice panel. Thank you.